Hi, everybody. I'm Lisa Carlin, your host. Welcome to another episode of Hey Doc, What's New in Plant-Based Medicine? I am just ecstatic to have this incredible family medicine and lifestyle medicine physician, Dr. Melissa Mon Mondala. I always, I always, it's like a doll. Mondala. There we go. You got it. You got it. That's right. Yes. yes. Welcome, Dr. Mondala. How are you? Thank you I'm for joining us today. Yes, it's such a joy and an honor. Thank you, Lisa Carlin. I love what you do in the plant-based world and in advocacy and animal agriculture, all that. You've been such a light and thank you so much for having me here on a Friday morning. Well, thank you for being here. I want to ask you what I ask all my guests. Hey, Doc, what's new in plant-based medicine? Yes, I love that question because there's always something new to talk about. And usually it has to do what we do on a day to day basis. Research does take time and does come along and I follow that and get updated. But really what's new is the Institute of Plant Based Medicine. And that's a new institute. It's multi specialty clinic with tons of doctors who are knowledgeable in the evidence of plant-based nutrition. They're all lifestyle medicine doctors where they follow nutrition, exercise, sleep, emotional well-being, and avoidance of toxic substances such as tobacco. And so I'm excited because we get to work hand in hand with cardiologists, gastroenterologists, my husband, rheumatology, and other plant-based dietitians and exercise physiologists. So that's an amazing I would say new in 2020. I know there's a lot of ups and downs and bad news and crisis, but I'm happy to say at least we can celebrate the IOPBM. It's a new institution where we can deliver the best multi-specialty care for our community. That is, that's wonderful. And your husband, Dr. Micah Yu, is going to be on, I think, in two weeks. Absolutely. I'm excited to have him on. His transformation story is one of a kind, and that's why he relates very well to his patients. That's wonderful. So let's let's start talking a little bit about you know about what you do. You've given me some slides, so I'm going to move over to the slides and put the first slide up. Let me just get to there. We sure, go. let's okay, get. Started. There we go. So you are. I want everybody to know that you are board certified in both family medicine and lifestyle medicine, and you're a diplomat of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Uh, you have a master's in health administration. And um, and you're also on the faculty of uh, uh, of um, your right. yeah I'm a, the board a board director and they have a, a wonderful board there yes you do at um, at, at uh, uh, Loma, it's Loma Linda right yes 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 mm -hmm. okay I didn't see the thing in front of me I didn't want to make a mistake so <laughs> I mean you're so young and you have all these credentials people are probably thinking I'm bringing on a really old person but look you look like you're in high school. <laughs> It's the anti-aging benefits of plant-based. I can't, I can't um, take all that credit. <laughs> all right, so let's talk about chronic diseases on the rise because it, it it has implications for COVID. It has implications for just there's there's so many people who are who have comorbidities. It makes their um their uh, 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 their course of their disease with if they happen to get COVID worse. So let's talk a little bit about why chronic diseases are on the rise and how that impacts COVID. Absolutely. So we know in 2020, the standard American diet, it's still the diet that has not gone away. More and more people are eating more processed foods, junk food, animal products, and dairy. And so those things are rising. And we know that by the CDC, every year they put out the same thing. One in four Americans have at least one chronic disease and then two and three chronic disease. In one patient, I see patients who have five chronic diseases and about 10 to 20 medications. I put that slide up earlier because it's so key because we know that COVID-19 is an infectious disease, but the more prone you are because of other comorbidities, we see about here about 55% of people who had COVID had hypertension, nearly in the 40 percentile, they had diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and so on, coronary artery disease. And I know we all know somebody who has this, maybe some renal dysfunction, liver um, disease, and that are smokers, COPD. And so we are just more prone to get ill. I would say there is a disclaimer, you know, there are healthy young people who get COVID, but we know that the highest majority are of those who get sick and have complications from COVID. If they're in hospitalized or if they're in the ICU or eventually die at an earlier 
premature death and they're actually more prone to actually getting COVID. And so that's what we need to tackle. We need to see and know the root causes of all chronic disease and even COVID. And so we have to understand that chronic disease starts with how we eat, how we move, how we sleep, how we connect with others, how we deal with stress and really trying to avoid those toxins. Like I'm going to say it over and over. We, sh we need to quit smoking and we need to minimize that alcohol because more and more and more times we get insults to our body by what we do on a day to day. That's that's true. That's true. Even the American Cancer Society came out with recommendations this year and they're they really would like people not to consume alcohol at all. And they did because they people would be too angry with them. Unfortunately, politics play a role. They said one drink for you know for, for women and two drinks for men. But if you look at their research, it's really no alcohol at all. So if you're consuming alcohol maybe once or twice a year, what would you say? Or not at all. Yeah, I definitely agree because, you know, when we study populations who do not consume alcohol, and this goes back in the Adventist health and the nurse health studies, where they very little or absolutely none, they have less complaints of GERD, of, of all those um, liver, esophageal cancer, um, all those things that really inflict um, more, I would say, <laughs> comorbidities. And that's what we have to be mindful of is the more you minimize those toxins, the more change chance and of uh, you having a longer healthier life so I, I definitely agree I have patients that when they quit their alcohol their a1c actually goes down they lose the weight because usually alcohol contains sugar right and artificial flavoring um, and so you have to be very mindful it's it's not, not that it's not, not that simple where you have to think, okay, just. I don't know what's happening to the sound. Can you hear me? I can. I can. Okay. Yeah, there we go. I don't know what happens to the sound. Um, the internet seems to be strong, but let's just, let's just continue. So you're saying the A1C, tell people what that is. What that, what is that measurement for? Sure. So the A1C is over a span of three months. It's hemoglobin that's glycolated and it measures the, the amount of sugars. So meaning it's an average. So some people like to get their point of care sugars or, or more, mainly a glucose, um, fasting glucose or after meals. And that just shows the immediate within that same day. But really we look at the pattern over three months. And that is really key because, you know, we're able to see um, improvements. Sometimes we check it every three months every six months every year depending on your doctor as a lifestyle doctor those are the numbers I like to see over time and you also got to know if you have maybe anemia such as because of iron deficiency anemia or sickle cell anemia or you have some type of liver disease or had a, a recent transfusion a blood transfusion those numbers will fluctuate so you have to know you know it's not that simple but at the same time it's a very good indicator of your previous blood sugar and so I, I really my focus is diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and that's metabolic syndrome. And metabolic syndrome is the most common chronic disease in America. It's all those three, and it's on top of being overweight and um, being obese. And so what's the difference between treating metabolic syndrome with, um, with medication versus with drugs? Do you not use any medication at all? Or how, how do you integrate medication into your practice when you're teaching people about whole food, whole food plant-based? Because I think the audience wants to know, does that mean if I see you, I'm not going to get drugs? How, how do you how do you address that? Very good question. Thank you, Lisa. And I, so I still, I go by medical guidelines. So there's American Heart Association, the American Cardiology Association. If you look at the hypertension guidelines, they, they say the first line treatment is lifestyle. And so I actually take that very, very seriously. Even if though your, your high blood pressure may be very elevated in stage two hypertension, I give you that opportunity and that chance to work with you very, very closely. I don't throw medications at you. I give you the 
time and the education and hopefully empower you so that you know step by step what to do with your hypertension and exactly the same thing for hyper um, lipidemia same thing where your cholesterol is high I'll work with you at least to one to three months so instead of throwing statins at you I can really work with you week by week month by month to see those numbers go down and I see it because once you treat hypertension you treat high cholesterol and you treat diabetes it's all the same and then you start losing weight and same thing with diabetes the American Diabetic Association they give you about one or three months as well and so instead of throwing again the metformin typical medications or glipizide or SGL2s or GL1Ps these are fancy fancy words but I I love science so I have to throw it in there and then even insulin um, so those are those are the processes of it but I still give you um, the chance and most of the time when patients work with me you'll see that go down from I've seen A1Cs go down from 12 to 10 to 6 to normal starting is and they didn't have to go on insulin it's because they really um, felt the connection with the um, the education that we gave um, the them, and I that's what I do I love it I do with every patient every single day that's it that's incredible what do you see most of do, do what would be the most prevalent would it be hypertension that people come in with uh, high blood pressure on one or more medications Absolutely. Um, those are the most common hypertension, hyper um, lipidemia, and diabetes. At the same time, I have younger populations coming to me because they have GERD, they have anxiety, they have depression. And so those are another trio of those and IBS. So let's say four. All of those come together. And sometimes doctors will throw two or three medications at each disease. However, I don't do that. I actually go into the root causes of their health. I look at all all four of those and I say you know what let's start with your diet let's get rid of those processed foods let's get rid of the sugary the salty the the artificial flavors like MSG and really focus on whole food plant-based and that really gets it. it it really eliminates the need for medications sometimes there is a need and we will work we will do that if it's if the patient is actually experiencing severe symptoms in a very acute phase so maybe just the first three or six months and then we'll use the lifestyle to bump it up and then they're actually they're so much better they don't have to come back um, to the point where they their disease state is getting worse and I love seeing those because literally I get testimonies um, every single day and it's it's just a joy and I, I really love what I do so so and yen lamb says this doc loves her job and it shows <laughs> I love that. I think that's great. Okay, so you know, uh, chronic disease, and then I, what I want to what I want to talk about because you did you participated in a in a forty two doc video that was done by uh, Borough President Eric Adams, mm -hmm. and it's all people of color. So I want to ask you, how do these lifestyle it, uh, diseases impact people of color versus people like me? Um. Caucasian from born here, but but ancestors came from uh, Eastern Europe. So how what's the difference between people who are African American, people of Asian descent, people of Native American descent, etc. Can you address that? And then I'm going to play the video, which is about two minutes and 42 seconds. It's long, but I thought it was so good. I have to play it. Yes, yes. This okay. is such an important time. Thank you. And I really, you know, I work in an FQHC and really patients live below the poverty line. And that's, um, it's tear jerking. But the reasons why they, they're actually doing um, living like that is usually because the lack of access to um, really great education. Um, they're, they're really not having the best job opportunities and their lifestyle is not the best because they don't have, we call this food deserts. If you look in their neighborhood, all they really have is liquor stores, um, really, and 7-Eleven. There's no um, nice fresh produce um, that you can see. Occasionally, you'll see a, a swap meet, but it's it's really hard. Um, on top of that, their stress is so, so high. They're working seven days a week. They're working to the point long hours, um, graveyard hours, um, and they're, they're really in a point of despair um, unfortunately they're very very grateful patients and I love that they can actually I empower them to eat um, one dollar meals um, really from the dollar store you can actually um, 
only use five dollars a day if you just use um, whole food plant-based meals and you can usually use some type of food stamp to do that so that's what we have in San Bernardino and so I would say there are so many factors that patients um, in with the color descent and including you know all kinds of cultural differences um, because of the just the previous generations of their the way of they not only um, had access their difficulties with that but also these they their values are a bit different just like me and you um, Lisa yeah so what about what about the impact of dairy on people of, of African descent and people of Asian descent my understanding is you find the largest percentage of people who are lactose intolerant can you talk a little bit about that and then I'm gonna play this video Absolutely. So if you look at the studies there, about 96% actually of Americans um, are lactose intolerant. That's very, very high. Um, and so that it also includes your African Americans, your Asians. We all actually have, there's a, these enzymes, especially in the Asian population that really give us a, a predisposition to more lactose intolerant um, sensitivity. There's all these different terms, but at the end of the day, it's because dairy is not meant for us. We are humans. We 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 only need the natural human milk at, at an earlier stage in life, but not cow's milk. Dr. Milton Mills calls it institutionalized racism. What do you think about that? <laughs> yeah, um, after, you know, he testified in front of the United States Dairy, a Dietary Guidelines Committee, and he had the um, the confidence to look at that committee. And that committee, he indicated from his comments that it was pretty. Uh, it was not a diverse committee. It was it looked basically like like middle America, but there were not, there were not ethnicities there. And he called it institutionalized racism. So what do you think about that? Yeah, well, if you look at the schools, elementary schools, and what they're fed, and especially in the the lower economic status um, communities, and their lunch pails are literally just, you know, they have their cow's milk and their cheese and their pizza. It's horrible. You know, they're given so little to give maybe less, I think it was less than a dollar to just make a meal. And it's, it's poor quality food. It's nutrient deficient. And, you know, these other, you know, they don't have the fresh fruits and the fresh vegetables. And that's what's sad because it's, it, they can afford it if you think about it and you do the math, but really it's these um, impoverished areas. That's all they're offering. So that, that's what I see. I, I actually can relate to that and say that is a huge shame. It is. Okay, I'm going to play this video and it is, um, it's two minutes and 42 seconds. So uh, we're, we're, we'll, we'll come right back afterwards. This is, this was put together by borough president Eric Adams and uh, who is the borough president of Brooklyn in New York. And it's an incredible video. And I'm very happy to say I'm going to have him on my show on October 23rd. Great. Real talk. This coronavirus, it affects everyone. It does not discriminate. But the talk that's more real is that it's affecting some people more than others. Way more. It's causing more serious and fatal results with patients who have pre-existing conditions. Hypertension. Heart disease. Lung disease. Diabetes. And obesity. And it's happening the most in black and brown communities. I can't believe I still have to acknowledge this reality, but I do. African Americans and Latinos continue to have higher rates of all of these preventable diseases and conditions. And that means that these people, our people, have a harder time fighting off COVID-19. In New York City and other major metropolitan areas, African Americans and Latinos are dying at rates that don't match the general population data. But this isn't new. People of color have been getting sicker and dying sooner from chronic conditions long before COVID-19 appeared. And there are so many factors that can cause this. It's access to health care. Economic stressors. Societal stressors. Misinformation. And many more. But there's no greater determinant for our health than the foods we eat. Or don't eat. It is now time we focus on the most effective medicine for our health, our food. I had type 2 diabetes, lost my sight, permanent nerve damage in my hands and feet, and decided to change the food that I was eating and saw within three weeks, my sight came back. Three months, my diabetes went in remission. I felt empowered. Free yourself from something that betrayed you, and that's the healthcare system and the diet that we are consuming. We need to remove the harmful foods from our diets 
and replace them with veggies, fruits, beans, whole grains, nuts, and seeds. We can prevent, treat, and reverse our diet-related conditions through the food we eat. Plant-based nutrition changed my life. I know it can change yours too. Eat for your health. Aliméntese por sus hijos. Essence for the front arbiter. Coma para un mejor mañana. Let's live and let's thrive. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, that just gives me the chills. It, it's just a wonderful, deep message. <laughs> I can, I love it. And so, so many of the physicians that I've been able to meet while I've been in this lifestyle and attending many of the uh, American College of Lifestyle Conference, the International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine for Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, I've met so many of these physicians, and it just, it just makes my heart sing mm. to see them stand up. And I, I, I just, I really want to say again, I want everybody to please. Please comment, um, ask questions, and uh, share this broadcast because so much more people will watch this broadcast not live, but because it will be up in you know in the archive and available both on YouTube um, at Jane Velez. It's called Jane Unchained News, and it will be on Twitter at JVM, and then of course on Facebook, uh, facebook.com forward slash Jane Velez Mitchell. So please, if you can comment, and uh, Dr. Mandala is going to um, respond to the comments in the next few days on Facebook. So if you have a question, you can actually put your question there. All right. Um, so what I want to do now is let's go back to the, the, the next slide and we'll talk about mental health because you are, I believe you're completing um, a fellowship in mental in psychiatry and you're going to be done in a few months. So let's talk a little bit about that and let's talk about mental health and how that integrates into wellness because the title of our show today is transforming your health at any age because family physicians are are, are board certified to treat infants through um, older adults through gerontology yes thank you thank you lisa and you know mental health is very very dear to my heart because i have my own personal story and you know this is um very you know it yesterday is actually uh, physician suicide awareness month so basically that means you know even no matter what type of um i would say facade anybody has there's so many there's so many symptoms of depression that maybe it may not be apparent to the common eye and so we have to be very very mindful of that people who are um have our you know, they're, it looks like their life is well put together either because they're a physician or a lawyer or, you know, they're your mom and, you know, but they're really bearing a lot on them, but they do it with a smile. They do it with grace, but that doesn't mean they don't have depression or anxiety or PTSD or even bipolar. And so we have to be very, very mindful of that. And so when I, when I say it's dear to my heart, because I had, I was a patient who had IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, had horrible um, symptoms because I just couldn't manage my stress. And that's what happens during medical training. And you're just frequently overwhelmed by that. And you have those overwhelming feelings of depression and you go just go through it because you're in, you're all, you're typically socially isolating yourself because you're, you're just studying so much. And, and that's what happens. And people, you know, just like every college student or high schooler, when they're studying really hard at these times, because they're pursuing higher education, they end up just having a bad relationship with food. And that's what I want to just pay attention to, because that means they're eating a lot of processed food, junk food, frozen food, and and they're just they're actually in traumatizing their whole gut microbiome. And so when I say mental health is declining, it's because the whole there there's a bad relationship with food. So you can see during COVID the statistics are horrible because there's a three times um, increase in prevalence of depression. And so more people are getting depressed and it's getting more severe. Um, so that means they're yeah. needing more medications, more therapy, their anxiety 
anxiety is off the chart and there's more use of once again of substances and so we just have to be very mindful and i know with me i had to go through my season and i know everyone does where they need to just ask for help um really um be comfortable i know a lot of people are scared of this white coat of doctors and and you know i have patients who haven't seen doctors for 20 30 years because of that fear but um that's why i believe in this interaction if it's through um social media or a book you're able to really get the um that that education you need and get the courage to face and get help so please please don't neglect your mental health find out what you can do because we're in this with you together and many of the things that you can do sometimes just have to do with what you choose to put in your mouth and then the environmental exposures in your home you know the 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 fragrances that you use the um the dryer sheets that go in your dryer there's you know all across the board the kinds of candles that you burn there's so many things that that will affect your your health your mental health uh, that have to do with your own personal environment in your home so i think it's really important let's talk a little bit about toxic foods Yes, so this is one of my favorite slides because it reminds me of, of the, let's step back a little bit. Back in 2017, there's a Canadian food um, scale that they did and they actually asked patients, do you eat whole foods? Do you eat um, processed foods or ultra, -ly pro ultra processed foods? And about 50% of people ate ultra processed foods. So what does that mean? That means literally um, you're refining it to the point where you can't recognize it, number one, and then you're adding all these items below and that's the added sugars, the food dyes, the MSG, they're being fried, they're excess sugar. And those are the things that actually um, promote um, chronic disease in the brain. So what does that mean? There's That means there's neurotoxic inflammation in the brain that goes on. Um, back in two, the early 1900s, there's a Minnesota starvation experiment study where really all they gave was macaroni, potatoes, um, and really uh, basically it wasn't a full plant-based diet. It was so deprived of nutrients that after six months, these men had more depression, more anxiety, hysteria, um, they had apathy, and they, they also had social withdrawal. So those are basically the symptoms for depression. And so um, that's what I see when I when I showed you that slide, people get more brain fog and people can recognize that because they, they just can't concentrate. They, their brain doesn't feel as energetic and active. And the other slide was just to demonstrate that there's so much processed meat and um, other things that have what I was mentioning here, the soda, thank you, and nitrates, aspartame. Um, those are the things that really get people to have more of these migraines. Um, so in migraines, women are big sufferers of migraines. Um, it's about, I would think it was 80 something percent. That's extremely high. Women have a hard time. Unfortunately, they just have are more prone to migraines. So we have to take action and be, be mindful of what we eat. Um, so coffee, Coffee and soda, huge factors. I have patients who eliminate their coffee or at least minimize it and their headaches, their anxiety, their palpitations and their, their shakes go away. It's beautiful. It really is. Let's talk about um, some other components because we all, you know, in previous shows, we've talked a lot about uh, heart disease and about uh, saturated fat and the impact of saturated fat and cholesterol on the diet. But what I want to do with you, so my, our audience has, has heard a lot about that, but you, you talk about some of the toxic substances and then some of the minerals that we really need to get into our diet. So let's take a look at this one. This is about magnesium. Why is it, should we take magnesium supplements or should we be getting it from food? Great, great question. So the studies that are, that I've seen mainly focus on magnesium supplements, but they forget that magnesium comes from plants. <laughs> and you know, yes, you take more magnesium, you have, most people think it helps with sleep and constipation and migraines, yes, but it also helps with depression and mental health. That's why they're my good food moods. And so look at these beautiful charts. You can find them in pumpkin seeds and spinach and um, edamame and avocado and cashews and that's what i what i love to just show patients because they actually can you know those people who hate to swallow pills and you know people most people who who enjoy nutrition don't like medications and supplements so i i actually use that as a nice leverage and say you know what that's a good way of thinking because you can actually get them from your plants i think that's great that's wonderful and and also fiber let's talk about the impact of fiber so we have constipation is is chronic 
and, mm -hmm. and chronic in this country. And Dr. Carolyn Trapp of Physicians Committee, when she spoke to the United, United States Dietary Guidelines Committee, she said, talked all about fiber, and her ending statement was, let's make America go again. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yes, let's go, because we literally, we live sedentary lives. We just sit there, and and we don't ha have the, the motion and the movement, so that just also mm -hmm. slows down our gut motility. On top of that, we lack fiber. And so literally, uh, if you look, the average person gets 15 grams of fiber when you need 30 at minimum, and then we I like to say 15, 80 if you really want to get there and tackle your health. And so we really got to appreciate fiber because it is, it's it's all attached to these antioxidants that I'm talking about, like the magnesium and 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 all the minerals that we need. So f you can't find fiber in in uh, something that's really ultra processed. It's very, very minimal. Most of the time, it's the exact opposite, where it's excess. We, you know, Americans have excess obsession of, of protein, animal protein. They're extra obsessed of those things because that's what the culture and the media has shown them. So I agree. Let's let's let some America go again. Let's be comfortable with um talking about fiber and we need it and when you eat a whole food plant-based diet you don't need the supplements you'll be getting fiber in every meal because if you're eating animal products they don't have fiber dairy products don't have fiber i you know dairy ice cream all of those things are void of fiber so if you look at eating a whole food plant-based diet everything you put in your mouth will have fiber to a greater or a lesser extent especially if it's unprocessed how about um, how about vitamin C? And let's talk about vitamin C and COVID as well. But let's talk mm. about the importance of we don't make vitamin C. It's why it's a vitamin. So we either need to supplement it or get it in our food. And let's talk about that. Yeah, so vitamin C, a lot of people have this obsession of vitamin C. As soon as COVID came out, they would get bulk powders and supplements, and really they forgot to actually find it in their foods. And I, I posted this because people think, and you know, Lisa, maybe you'll know, um, you know, when people think of vitamin C, they only think citrus foods, right? They only think um, the orange, right. but really you can find it in the variety of foods. Guava has the highest amount in this picture here, and I love it. And you can only, not only find it in the fruits but you can find in broccoli and tomatoes and that's what i i always encourage that vitamin c it is a water soluble vitamin you can pee it out that's why they say don't waste your your money on supplements because you're just going to pee it out but if you get the the vitamins the vitamin c in plant-based products it's attached to fiber and things that you don't just pee it out you actually absorb it <laughs> in your gut and it, it, it just does wonders in a systemic level it, it, it does. And uh, that and I love personally, I love um, sweet red bell pepper. And when I when I eat dips and things like hummus, which Juliana Hever says should be a uh, the, the plant based dietitian said should be a food group. And I agree. Okay. When I eat hummus, the question is, well, what are you going to dip into the hummus? You're not just going to eat it with a spoon, although I've been known to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I love sweet bell red, pe red, sweet red bell pepper. So I cut that into strips and use that to dip. And that way I get, I can have as much of the hummus as I want. I don't have to worry about all of the bread. Not that there's anything wrong with bread, whole, you know, um, uh, whole grain bread is, is, is certainly healthy. But if you want to try to get more vegetables and antioxidants and phytonutrients into your diet, I would say get your vitamin C from sweet red bell peppers. Ooh, I love that idea. I love my hummus. I spread it on everything. Anything from putting it on my vegetables, I put it in my salad too, um, just to give it that thicker consistency. Hummus is one of my treats. And that's what I do with my patients. Patients don't like beans in the beginning, but they do love hummus. And then once they appreciate the hummus, they they actually um, get accustomed to that flavor and they'll start trying the lentils and the black beans. So I think hummus is the gateway to the bean family. And I think when we, if people aren't eating a lot of fiber rich foods, they have to allow their gut microbiome a chance to adapt. So as their gut slowly adapts, then I find my clients are more willing to consume the legume group of foods. 
Yeah, absolutely. And you, if you, and some people are scared of the gas and the bloating, but really there's so much that they can do. They can soak it overnight. They can soak it for a few hours. You can add some lemon and some baking soda. That helps for some of my patients. And literally they're able to um, consume it more and more. It takes about one month at least for the microbiome to turn over and build that healthy gut. Because imagine you, you've had a lifetime of a very sick gut. Um, so it takes time and just be patient just like your palate and your taste buds change, so will your microbiome. Yeah. All right. I, what I'd like everybody to know is you are very active on social media and you've done some adorable TikTok videos. So I think it's time for a cooking TikTok video. Let's do the one, the one with the mango and the arugula salad. All right. So I'm going to try doing this and see if this, this works. I'm Hey guys, plant-based ceviche. Here it goes. I used a bunch of different cool ingredients. Look at this colorful madness, but super delicious. It is a substitute for the shrimp and the fish, but super yummy, colorful, delicious ingredients. Look, cauliflower, tomatoes, cucumbers, red onions, cilantro, and wine. You can add jalapeno and a pinch of salt and avocado if you want. That wasn't that wasn't the mango salad. That was the ceviche made with cauliflower, which is great. But I'm going to play the mango one now. Yes. We're going to have some fun with this mango salad. It's a bunch of different ingredients. I have this wild rocket arugula that I'm chopping away in about four inches. You can make bigger, smaller pieces, but don't forget the other parts. Look at this. I can use the stems. You can mix it in there. It's all good. Don't worry. The next part is the fun part, which is the hemp seeds that give you texture and wal walnuts can be pounded. Look, here you go, just like I do my garlic, make it into a fine baby texture. And then we're going to be adding our mango. Who doesn't love that mango? It's bomb. You can have a sweet or tart version. Cherry tomatoes, too. Those are fun from my garden. Look at this. Add as much as you want. Next is some lime, and lime is great for citrus flavor. Which is an apple, orange, squeeze that into sweet tamari too. Why not? We're gonna have that is so much fun. <laughs> so fun. Looks like you love to cook. I sure do. It's so therapeutic for me. I, I I just love just the whole process, just getting the groceries from the farmer's market or just a local grocery store, cutting it up and really just, I, that's my time to de-stress. Um, and I when I do these TikTok videos and IG lives, people say the same thing. They found it, it was their new hobby during quarantine. And so I love that people are able to try this at home. And that's what I love is just being able to show that it's simple, it's doable and it's it's actually so much fun and enjoyable and you do such a great job at it thank you you do such a you have fun and i think it's a wonderful way because really what i want the audience to know my audience the audience that's watching hey doc what's new with plant-based medicine is i try to create a profile of these plant-based physicians so people can become comfortable with well what are we trug you know tree hugging hippies are we well trained you know, are we legitimate and credible? Are we, you know, do we have the same board certifications and credibility, um, ability to um, to become part of, of major medical centers? Because if you don't have the right training, you can't have privileges in the major hospitals. So look at how fun this is and look at how fun my guests are. And I just, you know, I'm just, I'm thrilled to be able to have you and show how cool you make it to be whole food plant-based. Yeah, there's such a new generation of lifestyle medicine doctors. It's so exciting. More and more people as early as high school students and pre-med and residents um, all over young and older. And they're just coming together and they say, this is what I want. I, I want to be a a lifestyle medicine physician of any specialty. And that's what I love. You can be a cardiologist, you can be a family doc. And really it is, it is, I've always said it's the here and now. So let's just keep going and, and really more and more. Um, we, we talked about this, Lisa, so many other institutions are getting on this and we just have to keep going. We are, we are. Well, I, I, I'd like everybody to know that Social Compassion in Legislation, the organization I volunteer for, 
lat, uh, two years ago, we passed Senate Bill 1138 that requires all, it's for California only, requires um, all acute care hospitals, nursing homes, and prisons to offer at least one plant-based meal option at each meal service. It is now the law in California. And uh, the problem that we're having with this is people don't know it exists. Physicians don't know it exists. Patients don't know that it exists. And when I had the unfortunate experience of being in the hospital back in March, I had to tell the hospital, actually, I need a plant-based meal and you're supposed to provide it for me because it's the law. And first they thought I was a mental patient and then they realized I knew what I was doing. <laughs> yeah, and we need to we need that. You know, we talked about racial um, discrimination. We don't want our plant based community to feel discriminated. We want them to know that they can order that at the hospital. And I would say, finally, after years, almost five plus years at Loma Linda, we have the breakfast, lunch, and dinner plant based meals that they can offer. It is a vegetarian hospital, but it wasn't a whole food plant based hospital. And so yeah. it takes decades of commitment, taking um, changing the law, and and really advocating for the hospital and the institution so if you're in the hospital and if you want it please you are you are the voice um, you you can make that happen I've had so many of my patients volunteer in the hospital committees and share their story where they wanted to watch forks over knives or game changers on their television screen um, they thought that was more useful than watching the news I had he was he was a great patient he actually had um, a cabbage and he was turning whole food plant-based he was a a prior chef and a truck driver and he always were, um, went to the Circle K to, to eat and actually he changed to whole food plant-based and he was telling them um, at the hospital, please, I refuse to eat anything else because my sugar is just going to spike and every time it did, he would tell all the night nurses. It was such a fun story because <laughs> he would tell the night nurses, I refuse to eat that. You're going to sit down and watch for her overnight with me and what the health with me and they all watched it together. Um, <laughs> and now, for people that don't know, a cabbage is not the cabbage that we eat. He had a cabbage, a coronary artery bypass graft. So he had a, a, a vein from probably his legs placed into his heart because they were plotted off. So this is a very sick patient and you're saying he had diabetes also. So he knew more. We, we need to get our hospitals connected because they're not the department, the various departments within the hospital aren't talking to each other. And really that's what we need to have happen. And you know what? Our patients, the patients, we have a voice. We need to tell our physicians. We need to tell when you're in the hospital. They want to know your satisfaction. You need to let them know everything was great, but you had terrible food and not a single whole food plant-based meal for me, in spite of the fact that there's a law in the state of California to provide that. And what can you do if you're not in California? You can talk to your local assembly person or state senator, whoever your local state officials are in the legislature and tell them you want to do what they do in California because it will make your pop population of whatever state you're talking about healthier. Yes, absolutely. So, so let's talk about antioxidants. Yes. That is, that's the big deal and the difference between animal-based food and plant-based food. Animal-based foods are not rich in antioxidants. In fact, I don't think you'll find any. Yes, you nailed it on the, and I would say antioxidants, people try to once again, try to get it through a powder or a supplement, but really it's in the food. And the term antioxidants is really eating up all the free radicals and the oxidative stress. So you have less propensity for chronic disease. And so these are our healing products. And so here, look at these high amounts of Golgi berries, edelberries, um, the artichoke, um, nuts and seeds, all of those are pure. Um, you don't have have to worry most of the time if you get powders you have to worry because they add once again um these if you look at the back of the labels they'll have sugar they'll have caffeine they'll have all these extra sh extra things so when you look at labels try to go for the you know the, the actual fruit and the vegetable rather than trying to interpret that label if you need to then that's okay that's why we're here to help or your plant-based registered dietitian but i would say be mindful um, because your antioxidants can only be found in the fruits and the vegetables and the whole food plant-based meals and and what about color so you know people say well how do i know what to eat i tell people look at the rainbow look at how colorful this is how important is color in selecting fruits and vegetables. Yes, yeah, so phytonutrients. So that's a fancy term for basically plant nutrients. What you, what kind of nutrients you can find in plants? And the darker pigmentation, like you said, has the higher density of your 
for example, you don't want a see-through lettuce, you want a dark leafy kale or a dark leafy um, color, colored green, and that's going to fill you up. And you know that those are the ones I, I know for even myself, when I try to eat the light colors, I still feel a little bit hungry. But if I add a variety of the dark colored foods and add a balanced meal, so you can't just eat cabbage once again. Some people think I'm just going to focus on one plant alone. And really, that's not wise. You want the variety of the rainbow, the variety of whole food, plant-based foods. All right. I have another video that I'd like to play. Let's see. After work, I get really happy with taro milk. Here it is. You are the best the thing. Taro, put some dates. Put have ever said my one. eyes look good. It's non-caffeinated almond milk. So where do you get taro? Yes, so that is an Asian fruit typically, or a root, I mean, and that's grown from the ground. And people think, eh, why would you get something from the ground? But they're so good for you. Um, they, they're full of nutrients and minerals that you can't find in the processed foods, once again. And so it's a nice root, and you can boil it up, like I mentioned. You may have heard of, like, taro milk teas and everything. And so some people, that's all they drink every day. But I wanted to show people that they can make it from home. Not only save money, but also um, find a out what's in it people don't realize what makes food so it's simple in this recipe the date and the taro and then the almond or soy milk and it's that's what i want people to know when you get the right tools in your kitchen and you know what's in your food you can pretty much make a lot of things many many things and so you don't get bored with food um people think that um, plant-based can be very boring, but really I keep my my favorite foods in there. I just transform it to um, plant-based. I call it just veganize it, um, and that's the way you'll love it and keep going for a lifetime. Okay, that's great. So uh, so where do you buy taro? Oh, I just buy it from local, um, Asian yeah, Asian market. I've seen it um, sometimes, you know, Sprouts or or um, Whole Foods might carry it. It depends. But really, if you if you look at any cultural <laughs> store, you, you'll find it. And is it fresh? Yes, it's absolutely fresh. Um, there's if you look at it, but it's kind of it looks a little bit hairy on the outside, but you got to peel that out. And and once you get to the core of it, um, you know, that's the, the light. It's a very light purple pinkish color. Okay. All right. Let's talk about because you spent so much time and now you're in a, in, a, in a fellowship, additional training in psychiatry. Let's talk about addiction because in switching to a whole food plant-based diet, we're addicted to the foods, but people have other addictions as well besides drugs and alcohol. So let's talk about the addiction triangle. Yes, thank you. I think this is very, very important because when I talked earlier, earlier, what's your relationship with food? We got to know that we can have relationships with substances. If it's alcohol, um, your chocolate, or um, that just that, you know, we call it the, the weakness foods. But really, it's not about that. It's it's something more that's happening biochemically in the brain. So we look at the, the habit. So habit, that's this side of the triangle. That's just because of a ritual and routine. Maybe... Um, Every night you're going to the kitchen and you're looking for a snack or every afternoon when your energy feels low, you go to that kitchen or some people, they go, um, just like smokers, first thing in the morning, they pair it up by sitting outside, taking a smoke break, having some coffee. Other people pair it by at work, they go alongside, they, they chat with a friend and there's a break room and there's always a pile of candy there. And so that just becomes a habit that becomes year after year, days after days. The other side of it is the, the neurochemical component and that's the dopamine, the epinephrine and the serotonin. And you'll get, uh, there's another slide on that, but that details of that is because those are the, the ones that just people find pleasure. Uh, and that's a real thing. People find pleasure in food in smoking and drinking, and we can't deny it. That's why people do it. Um, and there's that other side of the triangle, which is pretty much, that's why it's so, it's almost like that trap and they feel very um, stuck in that lifestyle is because there's a physical um, component. Um, and just like I said, um, that is the other one where they're getting the reward pathway, but it actually suppresses their depression and their anxiety. And when we, when we feel that cycle where they actually start needing it um, and it's a negative relationship with food and it becomes a hard addiction, um, you're you're actually needing more and more of that substance. That's why some people don't just smoke one cigarette. They need they need five. 
years later they'll need one or two um, same thing with foods um, not it's not just that one ice cream it becomes we'll actually need ice cream with soda and chips and so you actually need more and more and your body and your brain is not satisfied. And, and so that's where we have to be very careful. And there's another slide that kind of shows the, the, the depiction there where your mood gets regulated um, because of your addiction. And so your, your mood is disrupted, it's dampened, they, people just feel more miserable, they're more depressed, they're more anxious, but then they go back to it because, oh, maybe I'll feel good again. Maybe I'll feel relieved, I won't feel, I won't feel on edge and they just go back and forth and they're never satisfied, unfortunately. So initially they might feel this pleasure and motivation and this drive, but then later on they'll need more and more of that substance. And so um, I, I always work with patients. Let's just, let's, let's go deep and let's find out what are the root causes of why you're going to these substances. And usually it's because of previous trauma or just um, bad habits or even um, their relationship with themselves or with others. And so this is more of the psychiatry behavioral component because I do a very thorough comprehensive evaluation in their whole childhood um, because we have to remember our childhood upbringing still affects our adult years. And how does that play into neurotransmitters? Yes, great question. Um, so when you're a child, you're 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 developing over the years, right? Um, your brain is formulating, um, and and in those stages, your brain is so vulnerable to what you eat. So if you're always eating the junk food, um given by the cafeteria, but maybe by a reward at home, your brain is not able to be fed the full fiber, the minerals and the antioxidants that really develop the brain. Um, I'll talk later about omega-3 and all these healthy plant-based products. And so what ends up happening, you're, you're, you have so many young ones getting symptoms of anxiety, ADHD, they're not able to focus because literally constantly they're eating some type of candy um, and they're pairing it with um, some chip and, and then they have their pure orange, um, it can be any type of juice, it can be orange juice, but really it's pure sugar. <laughs> and so they're just feeding the negative cycle. But once I, I've seen patients when they're able to get off that um, and you know switch, we call it swap, do the yeah. swap. Um, they're able to have, you know, do better in school. Um, and I was one of them. I, I noticed for me and myself, um, I, you know, I was able to concentrate better, do get better grades and better test scores. It, that just helped for me. And I see with my patients, even autistic patients, I have a lovely story. Um, this patient, she was in her late 20s very very young she had three children one of them was autistic she actually had bladder cancer and she was severely obese she lost all the weight um so that she had a normal weight but she also um was able to eat whole food plant-based exercise every day and she tried this for all her kids um not only did they were healthier and happier but their nonverbal autistic child started to speak again um and started to talk and i'm not saying you know a full-blown conversation but but just to have a few words. Um, and that was beauty, really a beautiful story because literally most of his life he was nonverbal. And so taking away those processed foods, rewiring the brain, it's never too late to rewire the brain, to heal your brain so that you have less proponents or less, I'm, I'm sorry, risk for depression, anxiety, um, ADHD, bipolar, and even dementia in the future. Okay, let's talk a little bit about depression. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so this is one of my favorite slides because if we look at the what comes before the, we call it the, the happy hormone, serotonin. And before the serotonin, it's actually um, from an amino acid called tryptophan and tyrosine. And these are the precursors of serotonin and all these healthy hormones in the body, neurotransmitters in the brain. And so you really want to focus on that nutritional support that you find in these foods. So this is your squash, your chia seeds. Um, I always say chia chia seeds, um, sesame seeds, hemp seeds, and flax seeds. Those are the easy four uh, basic ingredients you can put with every meal or in every smoothie. And that's what I love because it's fast and easy for those who are very, very busy. And you just get a tablespoon of each and you can do two if you want and you have all your fiber, but you also have your tryptophan and tyrosine. And then on top of that, you can get the other fruits and vegetables listed here. But if you start with the seeds, uh, it's super convenient. It is. And then let's talk about omegas. 
Yes, thank you. So Omega-3. Briefly, so let's talk about that a little bit. Oh, sure, sure. So Omega-3 will go fast here. And once again, it's that it's it feeds your, it's the fuel for your brain and you can find it in plant-based sources. So we, we want to always be sure that we, we think about food for our brain, for our gut, for our entire being. So these are just quick examples. I love to go into details. This could be a full lecture just on this. So I, I don't want to rush it, but I would say, you know, this is my heart and joy. I, I done a lifestyle medicine fellowship. So that's a one year program where I worked in the inpatient setting with patients who just had a stroke and a heart attack and those who had a spinal cord injury or tr uh, liver transplant. And I, I see lifestyle medicine work in the most sick patient and even the most healthy patient in the outpatient setting. So there's always a time and a place for lifestyle medicine. So please remember that. Ask for someone who can guide you. Absolutely. So before we end, we're getting towards the end, but we want to talk about your plant-based journey. How did you get involved with this lifestyle? At what point in your life and how did you meet your partner, your husband? <laughs> so can you give us a little story about, about how you got to this place and how you decided to do, you know, do family medicine and, and then integrate lifestyle medicine into your practice? Sure. Thank you. Yes. Let's just go back in time. You know, before I was the average, um, you know, Asian American who ate every type of animal, every carnivore, I, I appreciated plants, but I never knew that I had to eat it with every single meal until I went into my Loma Linda training as a family medicine doctor. And then I went to American College of Lifestyle Medicine where everyone I saw was just enjoying the plants. They were, they lived until they were in 90s and 100s like that was that was so new to me um and so i did a one week conference over there and i immersed myself and i said okay i can do it let's give it up i changed out my pantry and my fridge i brought my husband along and i said let's do it together and so we did we actually went to the point where we we went full on board, almost like cold turkey, and you know it was no turning back. And I and my husband, I met him, you know, um, back in medical school, and he was a, a different guy than you'll see now. <laughs> um, he's not the same weight. He's he he he's in a point where he really values nutrition. Before it was it was a you know, food was a hobby and an obsession, but now it's it's a tool to educate and to actually show people a better way of living. So yeah, I'll, I'll let you show our clip because we actually met in in more so during our college years, but also we actually lived five minutes away. We didn't even realize it. <laughs> um, it's, our, it's great, it's great clip. Let's put, I'll put the clip on. Give me just a second. All right. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You know, during this quarantine, people are really using social media and having fun with their uh, sharing their life. <laughs> um, so I, I love that you've invited me here, Lisa. I think that's, we, we got to make it real for people. The, the, and, we are I, and I added while, while you were talking, I added your TikTok handle, Dr. Oh. Lifeball 100. So if anybody, right, that's the, that's your handle? Um, sure, sorry, it's, um, so I changed it. So I'm trying to make everything the same. So it's just oh. melissamandala.md. I used to be Dr. Lifestyle 101. So I kind of go back and forth. I know the branding is- All right, I'm gonna change it. I'm, I'm just Melissa Mandala MD? Yeah, mm -hmm. dot MD. Dot MD for TikTok? Mm-hmm. Dot MD, and then Facebook didn't have the dot MD. It just was MD. Yeah, it was just that. Right, mm -hmm. Okay, so let's see if this is right. Perfect. That's um yeah. Facebook's right, the Instagram's right, and the TikTok. Yep. And am I missing any social media platforms that I should add? Um, I do have a, a little YouTube in the making, so I share some of my recipes there, and then okay. sometimes some, uh, Micah does his own. Um, and what's and what's the handle on YouTube? It's Doctor Lifestyle One Hundred and One. So Dr. Lifestyle One Hundred and One. Okay, I got it. There we go. We'll see it in a second. This is so much fun. <laughs> you're, 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 you amaze me. <laughs> you're a rock star just going away, doing your thing behind the scenes. I, I love there, we, there we go. YouTube, Dr. Lifestyle 101. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's All right. Connected. No spaces? 
no spaces. Okay, we did it. All right, I've got another fun video that we'll put on. So hang on, everybody. Let's. Don't be mad at me, cause I don't ever want to be what I don't have to be, yeah. I die happily, knowing that I never only give you half of me, yeah. Take me, but take your time, cause I don't want to spend the rest of my Uh, thank you for showing that. You caught me in action. I, I do love to dance and move, and um, I'm trying to bring that back. I, I used to be a, a cheerleader and very active, and now I spin, but, you know, this is who we are. We got to do things that keep us alive, give us purpose. And, That's and You were a cheerleader. I was a cheerleader, and my daughter was a cheerleader, oh. only she she was on a, on a winning team. They were number 13. They came Ooh. number one out of 2,700 teams in Florida. Wow. Her, but she she did yeah vegetarian my mm -hmm. daughter at vegetarian so I'll give her a little like she has a, a an activist apparel um business and uh, she's on 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 uh she's on all the social media platforms but it's at vegetarian so but but cheerleading is what gave her the um I guess the sense of leadership, the sense mm -hmm. of the sense of leadership, because when you're competing, you can't go out on Friday night. You have to get to bed early so you can get up early in the morning and do cheer hair and all the makeup and get to where you need to go. So it was a big part of, of what she learned in high school besides all the academics. Yeah, it was the best time. I would say that if I look back, I had a highlights in my in my earlier years. And, and that's exactly that. It's team based. It's the leadership. It's the discipline. It's the balanced lifestyle um, because you can you can exercise while studying, while um, being uh, a good student. So, so many great things out of cheerleading and then using your voice, <laughs> obviously, is a good one. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Using your voice, and you do that. You speak out for every, you speak out for everyone. And I love the fact that you go across all the, the lifespan from infancy to, um, to to gerontology, and that's in your in your in your domain. And that is just incredible. And um, I'll just ask you a question. I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Is a whole food plant based diet appropriate for pregnancy and appropriate for for pre-pregnancy, for pregnancy, and all the way through the lifespan to gerontology. That's a big yes, right? We know this over and over and over. That women who are plant-based or vegan, they they do it just fine. They take their B12 and their folate and you know and their vitamin D, and there's no nutritional. Um, you know deficiencies so after that they make healthy babies um and they're able to be um actually very 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 healthy because as long as they keep following it right <laughs> so mothers do well they have less postpartum depression too and anxiety so that's those are extra benefits um and i love i always want to emphasize some i have met patients who don't have a family doc or a primary care doc and i you know i really see that that's um, unfortunate because, you know, I value my specialists. They're my partners. You know, um, if you need a dermatologist or a gastroenterologist, that's great. But, you know, the primary care doctor, we really see everything, all the systems together. We're your partners. And really, please um, find one. Um, don't wait to not get help because that's that's what we need during these dire times. Oh, thank you. Yes. And you can find me here at the Institute of Plant-Based Medicine or my personal website, melissamandala.md. Um, md.com and i'm t doing telemedicine visits and in-person visits here in newport beach and so i have a license in california and florida and more licenses to come so if you want to see me just give me a message on my instagram or email any way you want that's wonderful well any closing comments yeah um so i just want to say a big thank you again for lisa and you know this is we can't do it alone we need each other we need we need our our community and i know that you don't have to be plant-based to actually be seen by us lifestyle doctors and please just take away any other fears and i really know that we, if we just show ourselves um compassion and get over some of the guilt you can really be healed and transformed so don't give up on yourself beautifully said so I want to thank you so much for being here, and, and I hope you will come back in a few months. We're going to see your husband, a rheumatologist, Dr. Micah Yu, in uh, two weeks. And next week, we have Dr. Christy Funk, the board-certified breast cancer surgeon, and she's going to come on, do a whole show with us, and then she's going to promote the um, her 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 uh, summit. She's having a breast cancer summit in uh, Palos Verdes, California. So we're going to talk all about that. Pinklotus.com if you want to get more information about that. 
But in the meantime, I'm Lisa Carlin, your host for Hey Doc, What's New in Plant-Based Medicine. Please share the stream. Please have a discussion with your family and friends. This is really life-saving information, and we can all improve the quality of our lives. Let's start today. Thank you so much, Dr. Mandela, Melissa, my friend, my social media. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. So, and, and, uh, and we will be back. So thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a great day.